Hello and greetings from Iceland. Today I have an extra large information package mixed with new footage from my photo tour last week to the Blue Lagoon and Grindavik and the full travel story of course. But this video is however for the most part about the future but I'm starting with a growing tension since the winter fishing season just started recently and there is no fish coming to one of Iceland's best and safest fishing port, the port of Grindavik for the first time in centuries. And this is also near some of Iceland's best fishing grounds. So this video is a good chance for you to see what makes the town tick century after century. And those are first generation fishing camps that developed into a complicated production, export and distribution chain that starts when the boats come in. This is also a race against the clock. This is a fishing hub with its own fish market, and some of it is processed for fresh fish export, where it is first shipped to the Keflavik International Airport, so customers in New York or London can buy it fresh the day after, and all over the world. And behind this chain are old business connections, workmanship, logistics, or important infrastructure of the town, all at risk due to uncertainty. So when it was announced last Thursday that the Blue Lagoon could open up for business, while uh, there would be no other business operating from Grindavik, and the harbor would still remain closed, that was in a way the hair that uh, broke the camel's back. Or should you say, it was a facial hair removed after a mud treatment in the Blue Lagoon that uh, broke the camel's back this time. So some of the local business owners, they went nuts over this. But this announcement was, however, what I had been waiting for. So I threw my stuff into the car the next morning, Friday morning, and my plan was to drive straight to the Blue Lagoon, because I knew I couldn't get any closer to town than that, or to use the Blue Lagoon car park as a platform to get closer to town, like I did shortly before the last eruption. But this time I felt as I could get even more lucky. The official Blue Lagoon road ended up under lava, during the last eruption, and the bypass road that is used by tourists now, it uh, opened up several more filming locations for me, so you can just imagine how I felt about that, since uh, changes in the landscape are a big part of my documentation, like during my last visit I was filming uh, the new lava barriers between eruptions number 5 and 6, and uh, after eruption number 6 we got this new landscape, that we might only have there for one or two weeks more. So I'm running out of time, since the next eruption might be only days away. So when I arrived to Reykjavik, I bought myself a fast charging unit to have in a car to make sure that I got the job done. Then I checked the Blue Lagoon homepage once more, but only to find out that there was this new checkpoint, a checkpoint that wasn't there before the last eruption. And uh, to get past, that the checkpoint, I would have to buy a ticket to the Blue Lagoon. And uh, since this is a civilized channel, I'm not going to repeat what I was thinking. And after a few breathing exercises, I decided to uh, do the damage check on the Blue Lagoon uh, booking page. And strangely enough, even if they had just opened up again, they were almost uh, sold out. The only available times were between 8 and 9 o'clock in the morning or those very expensive tickets with uh, free drinks of choice included. And I can't say I needed that early in the morning. So this was a painful moment when I had to buy a ticket to the Blue Lagoon to be able to uh, take uh, some photos of my old uh, workplace and home. And uh, 20 minutes before 8 the morning after, I was there by Checkpoint Blue Lagoon where I encountered what is perhaps the most childish law enforcement act that I have ever witnessed in my life. So I stopped my car there at the checkpoint, showed them my ticket, and the kids there that were dressed up like security guards were saying that I would have to wait there in line with the hazard lights on. The cars were piling up on the road, all showing obedience with the hazard lights, and we waited and waited. Then we were told that uh, it was a police that uh, would have to give the green light for access 
only a few stuff cars driving through every now and then. So we just sat there, 100 or 200 people in our cars with the blinking lights when the cops uh, finally came and it must have been a police department that hasn't heard about this invention called a mobile phone. They just came, waved their hands and turned around and things got finally moving while the kids had uh, a really good time pretending that they were hurting sheep or driving around like idiots with uh, yellow blinking lights, even in the Blue Lagoon car park. And I had to show them my very expensive ticket to the Blue Lagoon for the second time, and I got the feeling that I was trying to swindle myself into a concert with a superstar with a fake ticket. So when we finally got to the Blue Lagoon car park, I was in no mood for using the ticket. If they would have offered me bacon and eggs instead of the free drink, I might have considered. But since I didn't expect this twist, I didn't bring any swimsuits, and it is not good for my mental stability to look at price lists for tourists. So I sat in a car with a dry and dull sandwich while I discovered that this was an extremely windy day. And strictly speaking, it was the sort of day when you don't use a drone. Ever. And wind is actually one of the trademarks of the Reykjanes Peninsula. I'm not going to say it's always windy there, but almost. And I often take the drone off from the hood of my car, but it wasn't possible to make it uh, stay still there until I could press the takeoff button. And the first filming target was the road that got flooded with the lava the other day, the intersection to the Blue Lagoon. I also wanted to get a good establishing shot from higher up, covering the new lava field completely and uh, even fly all the way up to the critters since uh, I had the range for it. But I only managed to fly around one kilometer away from a car park. The drone was complaining the whole time and somehow it just headed with me and started to uh, do this uh, out of control descent that made me sweat because this was not the day to uh, go hiking on a lava field searching for a drone. And it was a lot of struggle to maintain control so I turned back with only a fraction of the footage that I needed. But I did manage to get decent footage from a new pipeline that is like the old one, open for the next disaster. And uh, when it was uh, time to land, the drone didn't want to. I think it wanted a new owner. But uh, the problem might be a downward sensor. The drone just kept on bouncing from the landing platform like a kangaroo on steroids. And this uh, first trip of the day was a total bummer. So I took off to take off spot number two by Mount Thorbjörn. It's the best place to fly over the town. I've done it before, but I could hardly open the car door there due to wind. So plan B was the super zoom camera, but it was hard to keep it stable from the car window. So most of the footage I got was very shaky. But as I was on my way back beside the town, getting closer to the checkpoint again at the lower ground, I found out that there was a little less wind there, so I found a little car park, hoping that I would not get interrupted by the police, because I wanted to film this fracture like I've done before. Or like I've been saying, it's a big deal for me to capture all those before and after videos. Like the ground here, it sank, the pond is bigger, and it is this kind of footage that shows us those uh, enormous forces at work. And I wanted to do a trip over this uh, fracture with the thermal drone as well, but uh, it doesn't have uh, strong enough motors to handle wind like that. So I came back from this part of the trip with uh, bits and pieces that I can use in this and the other updates. But uh, looking at this town without the community, it uh, made me think a lot about the future or what a terrible waste it is to abandon the town with uh, 90% of uh, all the buildings in usable condition. It's just uh, too much to just give up. But I'm also of the opinion that Mother Earth has also some job left to do there. And it's too early to just move into town and act as nothing happened and nothing will happen. There has to be some middle way. And after a local company made a strongly worded statement after the Blue Lagoon opened, it was decided to open the town up for business, again, with no time limitations this time. 
people can stay there day and night, but at their own risk. And this is a big step forward, although the town will remain closed for outsiders still, and there are still major obstacles to deal with. The cold water pipeline it got damaged during the eruption in January, like the hot water pipeline as well. So around 50% of the hot water is going to waste now, but those problems will be fixed in the next few days. Although new problems will for sure be found when they pressurize the system fully. So this won't be simple, but it will make the town habitable again. But uh, we are also very much aware of the fact that it might be evacuated again and again during the next eruptions that will uh, hopefully take place further away from town from now. And we actually got a new risk uh, assessment map yesterday and I noticed that the area to the west from Mount Thorbjörn and the Blue Lagoon is now in a higher risk category than it was before. I've not heard uh, anything from geologists about it or why this is the case, but from what we already know, there is another set of ancient craters around there and a few of our experts have been expecting an eruption to take place there or the activity to move to the west. So they might be getting ready for such change. But if we are going to use the earthquake map to predict the location of the next eruption, I would say even further north than the last one, which is good news. And it is also interesting to look at this trend that I mentioned a while ago, or this lineup that has become even sharper than before. So is magma trying to make it for Mount Faradalsfjall again, or closing the circle that started almost exactly there in 2021. And this is actually a good place for an eruption. But uh, of course it's uh, wishful thinking to expect the next eruption there. And we are in this uh, long chain of events that could, uh, according to history, go on for the next 200 years, which uh, may not sound very promising for the future of the town. But uh, we do also have historical and geological data telling us that eruptions will not be confined to this one area around Grindavík. So I think it's uh, too early to give up, give up on the town. Although we know and uh, accept the fact that uh, life will never be quite the same there, and the town might be evacuated monthly for the next year. And uh, the Blue Lagoon as well. It has already been decided that the Icelandic state will uh, buy all houses and apartments so the residents can uh, remove themselves from this holding pattern they've been in and start a new life elsewhere. But we have also many former residents that want to move back as soon as uh, there is more solid ground for it and uh, all infrastructure is working again. So how sensible is this dream about to move back someday? And I think it's uh, sensible enough to keep that option open and the first step was to open the harbor up for business, protect the companies and business connections, commitments to customers and such, and to use the fish process facilities to keep uh, jobs in town, make sure that the municipality gets uh, some income, and overall just uh, keep it from becoming a ghost town. But the land under some parts of the town is very fractured. Those areas can, however, be found with ground penetrating radars and fixed. 80% of the town has already been scanned, but only half of that data has been analyzed so far, so it won't be long until we find all the risky spots. And until then, there are still some restrictions within the town. But the worst problem now is the housing shortage outside of Grindavík. There is a bill now making its way through the parliament that includes a special holding company to be established. It will uh, buy out the residents who wish so, take over the loans and such. And I happened to listen to a citizens meeting yesterday where this uh, new bill was discussed. And one of the issues that remains open is the rights of the inhabitants to buy back their properties if and when things cool down. The first draft mentioned two years. The residents had two years to make up their minds if they would like to uh, buy back their properties. 
but I wanted to be five years and uh, I think that geologists will support that. Two years is a very short time in geology. So I sense this uh, urge to keep the community alive through this uh, discussion about this uh, buyback deal. But what we see already is people with young children, they are in many cases not coming back. No surprises there. This was very hard and no experts can predict the future. That remains uh, very uncertain. There is this constant magma flow into this magma chamber that is almost directly under the Blue Lagoon. It holds only 10 million cubic meters of magma and the inflow to this chamber could stop after the next eruption or it could go on for years, so we could just as well have 10 more eruptions this year alone. But the eruptions as such, they might not be the worst case scenario. Or if the lava barriers that they are still working on will hold, so they alone might get the town through several more eruptions nearby. And it was this rifting event from this dike that caused uh, most of the damage that they are dealing with now. And all we need is one such event and all those pipelines that have been fixed will be gone again. So I'm not seeing anyone moving back permanently for the next months. We will be seeing people coming there for work in the morning, leaving in the afternoon. But uh, the work goes on to prepare the town for a real future. Like the main road into town is being fixed and those infrastructure projects have been going quite well actually. But we have still uh, serious issues to solve. The old people from the local retirement home, they are scattered all over the peninsula. So that little community is uh, gone as such. And the same can be said for uh, children at the kindergarten and preschool age. Although the town uh, Reykjanesbær by Keflavik Airport has done a good job taking them in. But uh, there is not room for them all. And it is a housing issue where the government failed although they reacted well in other problem categories. We are one of the 10 most sparsely populated countries in the world. We have enough manpower, land and skills to uh, create 50 or 100 streets in a few weeks in uh, towns and villages around Iceland, throw down some pipelines, electricity and do permanent or temporary foundations for modular houses like we did in 1973 after the eruption in Westman Islands. But what the government did was to buy all available apartments of the market that was already start, meaning they pressed up prices and rental prices as well. The root cause is a lack of housing, not building plots. And it is as the government doesn't understand the main problem fully. So this biggest housing crisis since 1973 remains unsolved and this is likely a part of the reason why so many are more than willing to move back soon or to a volcano that uh, is burning every now and then but this uh, rip of housing market is burning all the time so there are many angles to this story that is about so much more than geology but I will however go deeper into the geology in my next video and we expect the next eruption to start around March 1st so I will be in the Reykjanes region two days earlier, since uh, it's been a while since I filmed the red stuff close up, and uh, it's challenging to do so, but uh, I have to get there in time, and uh, you can expect two or three short videos until I go to Reykjavik again. I've been uh, processing uh, many of the files from the last tour, so even though it was uh, not everything I hoped for, I finally found a chance to get something back from the wind, but my drone will never forgive me. And with that, I'm sending you best regards from the Volcano Island, Iceland.